PESNET Plus s'inscrit donc dans le cadre du programme européen Horizon 2020 qui est dédié à la recherche et l'innovation. Et sur son volet relations internationales, euh, il est clair que son objectif central concerne les relations en termes de production scientifique. Comme l'Horizon 2020 l'indique, sont identifiés des défis sociétaux. Le premier concerne la santé, le deuxième concerne la, les ressources alimentaires, euh, notamment agricoles et marines. Et le troisième concerne les aspects liés à l'environnement, au climat et aux ressources aux matières premières. Nous sommes 16 partenaires pour animer ce projet partenaires de l'Europe et partenaires de la région Pacifique. Certains États de la région y sont présents au travers de leurs organismes. Des organismes régionaux, coordinateurs d'action régionale sont présents aussi. Au niveau européen, des partenaires de différents pays et des organisations multinationales de différents secteurs contribuent à ce programme au travers de ces actions. Et la coordination en fait s'effectue très concrètement au travers des ateliers, au travers des des documents de synthèse au travers des plateformes birégionales, de, des financements euh, qu'on appelle le seed funding, donc des financements d'amorçage. Toutes ces actions sont menées conjointement. Our aim is really to foster the collaboration between the research side, the universities, the industry and the, the international organizations like the European Commission, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank. I also found the uh, building of networks, the consolidation of existing networks and, and building new networks to be really important too. And I think that that was nice having having those different parties, having environmental scientists and, and hardcore scientists, chemists and, and the like, and social scientists talking about the same sorts of issues. I think it's really important and, the, and finding the ways to make that happen is, is, it seems to have happened quite well here. And if we can do that, you know, if, if we're looking at saving the world, one way or the other, that's, that's the sort of collaboration that needs to, be, needs to be pushed forward. Cette voix du Pacifique est très consciente du fait que nous sommes de petites îles, des microcosmes. Nous avons une difficulté en termes d'acquisition de, de données mais également en termes de ressources humaines, de capacity building, et nous avons besoin de cette coopération, euh, mais en étant aussi convaincus que nous pouvons apporter beaucoup à l'Europe. Aujourd'hui, nous parlons beaucoup de changement climatique, nous voyons que ça réorganise la carte au niveau mondial, nous avons des maladies qui précédemment étaient purement tropicales et subtropicales, donc qui n'intéressaient qu'une petite euh, on va dire, population. Aujourd'hui, ces maladies gagnent l'Europe, et donc, à ce niveau-là, nous avons cette capacité localement de pouvoir collaborer, de pouvoir apporter également nos connaissances. Mais nous avons besoin pour cela d'être beaucoup plus efficaces dans notre partenariat et surtout d'adresser ensemble les questions qui concernent nos sociétés. As an Australian, as an Indigenous person from Australia, there is much that we can share with the Pacific Islands, and I think this is the start of a conversation. It's not just about dialogue, it's about dialogic action. And the Pacific has very strong traditional knowledge in a number of areas in terms of food security um, and uh, weather patterns um, and uh, threats to uh, ecosystems. So uh, the EU can benefit from that traditional knowledge that our people hold and uh, concurrently we can um, work with the EU to, to find that research and, and, and get those innovative, innovative solutions that we need for the Pacific region. It's a great partnership. So, when we talk about health, how do we really define health? Yeah, if you look at the WHO constitution back in the 48, Health is the state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and it's not only the absence of disease, it's the well-being part. That's the global definition, if you like, the WHO global definition. The Pacific Health Ministers took it a bit a step further and back in 95 they came up with the Yanuva Declaration on Healthy Islands, where they talked about healthy islands from a very comprehensive an overarching perspective, more like a vision rather than a specific outcome. So the ministers came up with the definition as healthy islands are places where 
children are nurtured in body and mind, where the environment invite for learning and leisure, where people work and age with dignity, and where the ecological balance is a sort of pride, a source of pride, and where the ocean which sustains us is protected. Le Pacifique est une forme d'observatoire avancé en ce qui concerne euh, l'étude et la connaissance des maladies infectieuses. L'Europe a tout intérêt à avoir un, un regard attentif sur ce qui se passe dans le Pacifique, puisque ça lui permet d'améliorer sa connaissance, connaissance fondamentale, ça lui permet très d'anticiper des menaces, car il faut, il faut être clair, on l'a vu, le village global, ce qui se passe dans le Pacifique, un jour ou l'autre, se passera dans la zone européenne. On le voit sur les maladies infectieuses, c'est le cas, on le verra également pour la ciguatera. And we have not explored much in the Pacific. Still, there is a big potential. We do a lot of uh, science and technology, but appropriate technology, appropriate innovation is something that is missing. Because what is our comparative advantage in the Pacific countries and how we can become sustainable in the world? That is important issue that is missing. And we are focusing on something which is trivial to some extent. And we are not focusing enough on such issues which are highly pertinent, they can grow, they can bring development to the Pacific, and they can be sustainable so that we have got comparative advantage in this changing world. And that is very, very important. Traditional knowledge practices in controlling, so everything we do, the, the, the Pacific people have some traditional ways of doing it, which can better inform our science and provide more solutions and opportunities for uh, innovation that responds to social and economic. Les institutions européennes, les organisations européennes, les centres de recherche européens ont des savoir-faire, ont des niveaux d'expertise qu'on n'a pas toujours dans le Pacifique. Et là aussi, ça peut bénéficier, ça peut aider à améliorer le niveau de connaissance dans le Pacifique, au niveau de nos chercheurs, de nos équipes de recherche, des populations, et ça ne peut être qu'une valeur ajoutée pour le Pacifique. And just on behalf of the, of the uh, Think Tank team, I, I want to thank the EC for creating the opportunity to, to network, to exchange ideas, to exchange experience. That's been absolutely invaluable. And uh, we really do appreciate the support of, uh, of the EC in doing that. Have a look at the Pacific. It's not 15% of the globe. It's nearly a third of the globe. Very large. It's vast. So what I want you to get your idea is how vast it is. We've talked about how important it is in terms of fisheries, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of mineral resources. What I want to say is how important it is in terms of heat and mass transfer, the global heat and mass transfer. This is the great engine of global heat and mass transfer. The region is incredibly diverse. We've talked about the social, the cultural, the geographic diversity. So, what did we do in the, the think tank? We explored several themes. The knowledge necessary to develop communi community resilience. And I want to say something about community resilience. You know, over the last 12,000 years, people in the Pacific have proved themselves remarkably resilient to major things, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis. But the challenges that they face now are of a different character and they are not well adapted to them. Il s'agit donc d'identifier des moyens innovants, en tout cas pour la région Pacifique, donc plus ou moins innovants, qui peuvent être parfois des adaptations, pour faire en sorte que ces exploitations minières puissent être menées d'une façon à favoriser le développement harmonieux des pays qui accueillent ces exploitations, et donc qui rééquilibre un petit peu le coût environnemental et social de ces exploitations minières et les, les bénéfices économiques. Ce qu'il y a de nouveau pour moi dans, dans ce PaceNet, c'est que Bien sûr, on a créé du réseau, on, a, on rencontre des scientifiques de toutes les disciplines et de, de tous les pays autour. Mais en plus là, on a eu des ateliers spécifiques dans mon domaine, les géosciences et les ressources minérales. Il n'y a pas beaucoup de programmes qui tiennent compte de ce domaine-là, les ressources minérales. Donc c'était nouveau. Et concrètement, dans ces ateliers, on est allé à définir des objectifs et à faire des, des ébauches de projets. 
often when we're talking about mining and the environment, it, there's very negative connotations put on those activities and um, to see what some of the South Pacific communities are doing, particularly Cook Island in preparation for deep sea mining is really encouraging and um, it, it gives me um, a hope that we can um, make that transition into some of those challenging environments while, while protecting our environment and making sure we've got your community buy-in and communities benefit from those activities. Donc la région du Pacifique Sud-Ouest est caractérisée par, euh, du point de vue climatique et océanographique, euh, ce qu'on appelle la zone de convergence du Pacifique Sud, qui influe fortement le climat régional et même le mondial, puisque c'est l'évolution de la zone de convergence du Pacifique Sud qui déclenche ou pas les phénomènes El Niño et El Niña, qui ont des conséquences importantes euh, à, à, à l'échelle du bassin pacifique. Deuxième point important de la région, c'est que la région est caractérisée par une très très forte sismicité et volcanisme dû à, à des vitesses relatives entre les plaques très rapides, les plus rapides au monde. Tout cela, euh, des irréculés, forte démographie et qui ont besoin de ressources donc pour, pour vivre. Et donc euh, les variations, enfin les changements euh, naturels et anthropiques sur ces sites ont des impacts importants. Donc d'où euh, la nécessité d'avoir des observatoires sur le long terme pour appréhender ces phénomènes et les impacts sur la population. I think the methodology that PaceNet's using is really innovative. Um, and I think it's a real challenge to bring people together from across disciplines and I've been really impressed with the methodology. It works you really hard, uh, the long days, and you get really tired, and you, you do, you work really hard. But to be able to bring a group of people together who don't know each other from different parts of the world, and at the end of seven hours to actually be presenting ideas and outcomes is pretty impressive. Why do we need seed funding? We're talking a lot about cooperation, we have got our think tanks, but we also want to enable and encourage Pacific um, and European researchers to network and to bring their ideas and practice, filling scientific gaps and um, also implementing joint activities. Um, for this, um, we have got 5% of our whole budget, that means we have got 150,000 euros just for our seed funding projects. And this is very interesting, I think. Um, this is a list of all the applicants, co-applicants we have. And you see that we are from Australia to Sweden, to Switzerland, to Austria, to Cook Island, to the Netherlands. We have put plenty of applicants who are interested to work about the South Pacific, to work with the South Pacific. Perhaps the most important finding is that the region is very heterogeneous, extremely heterogeneous. There are some countries that have a more advanced innovation system. In these cases, you find that there is a significant investment in R&D. Enterprises um, engage in innovation. There's plenty of interest of in, in innovation. And um, there is good public-private partnerships and interaction per pursuing innovation. The government is heavily involved in innovation and supports innovation in, in the region. As a result, you can see that they have uh, uh, incubators and all the instruments that you would see in some of the most advanced countries. Um, uh, there is, on the other hand, some less uh, 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 advanced innovation systems. However, we have identified some areas for potential, particularly in the agricultural sector. Um, and we found, for example, potential for banana and taro uh, uh, value addition. We found potential, for example, also for uh, coconut cosmetics. And there are a number of agricultural products where we see lots, uh, lots of future. With the results also that we obtain thanks to PaceNet Plus on innovation, which will then help us. So, one of the contributions is that we are situated well in this kind of cycle of the project where there was research, research, technology, innovation, and how it will nourish the axes, it will influence the axes, it will even direct the axes of development. Et ceci en discussion entre le Pacifique et l'Union européenne. Donc, euh, je pense que ça répond euh, vraiment à ça. Donc, on est en train de développer plusieurs actes, notamment dans le secteur des pêches ou, ou d'autres, qui, on espère, vont ensuite faire partie de la programmation développement du 11e Fed. So, through the, uh, the Pacific Islands University Research Network. Uh, the opportunity to meet 
as scientists, as researchers, is available. And that is for us um, academicians, for us researchers in the Pacific region, that is a great advantage to have this platform, uh, to have the opportunity to meet as scientists. And, uh, and Pion is an output, is a product of PaceNet. And through this network, um, for the first time ever, we scientists now working together to solve regional problems. That if we think about all the challenges that we face, virtually all of them have a scientific component to decisions that policymakers have to make. And what we've seen over the last decade, two decades, is an increased recognition that science has a particular place to play in the policy process. Science does not make policy. Clearly, we all understand that decisions made at national levels involve diplomatic, fiscal, public opinion, political considerations, which in the end are the large determinants of what makes for the deciding on the various trade-offs that are involved in policy formation. But what science does is play a particularly privileged role in defining what we know and what we don't know and providing that information to the policymaker in a way that they can use that to inform the trade-offs they make. Having said that scientists, just by their nature, are not necessarily well equipped to interface well with the policy process, there's a need to develop scientists who have the capacities to, to bridge that gap and equally the need to create the demand to understand within the policy community what science can offer. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're talking about a fairly complex uh, relationship here. You're talking about a, essentially a region-to-region -region relationship in science and technology and innovation. And that has many dimensions to it, and, and one has to always take into account all the perspectives and all the dimensions. I mean, there's, there's, the, there's the dimension of, of the scientific cooperation itself and the individual partnerships, and that's always a, a relatively easy discussion because scientists are very focused individuals, they know exactly what they want to do, they get their money and they do the work. But there are many other dimensions to, to this relationship, I mean, and not least the, the political dimension, and that is notoriously a, a, a slow and long-running process. And um, so PaceNet's role is not just in promoting scientific discussion, which would be very straightforward, but in encouraging uh, that political relationship between the two regions, which uh, has a role in, in, in reinforcing the landscape within which science operates. And I'd say that's, that's quite a big task. It requires a lot of understanding amongst the, the actors who are responsible for making the right decisions and then convincing them to come to the table. And uh, yeah, there are, there are so many dimensions that I think that begins to explain why this is a long-term process. Whenever is discussed uh, in our bilateral or regional cooperation in energy, climate change, uh, disaster risk reduction or disaster risk management, uh, and so on, takes account of their input. We, we, we try to be as inclusive as possible involved in civil society and uh, the private sector in our, in our discussion with the governments. But at one point, it all comes up to lobbying your governments so that your point of view is taken into consideration. At that point, of course, in the concrete projects that will come out and will be funded, uh, there will be, and I believe there must be, a component uh, of science and technology and definitely only of innovation. My plea to you, as I did now in other conferences, is to make your voice heard wherever you can through all your national delegates when they go to Paris and we'll talk about climate change and they do not forget how important for the whole climate change agenda the oceans are. So I have already started to do this in my capacity here in the European Commission by talking to the colleagues who will represent the European Commission. But I give this back to you, to every one of you, to take that collective responsibility because I think there's a lot to be said 
we have to convince the terrestrial people. And since I work in the marine environment, I make a distinction between 90% of terrestrial people, because we continue, at least in Europe, to talk about planet Earth. You might talk in your part of the world about planet ocean. We don't. So I think to learn as well from you and to hear from you how certain things could be brought forward for policy making, this is very important. But if you have anything which I should take home to my own colleagues, because we have ongoing discussions, we have to listen to what is going on outside Europe, as I said, it is extremely important for us, both for policy making we need to be well informed and we need to scientific evidence as was raised uh, just when I came in. And secondly, whatever we want to strategically develop for the future needs also take into account developments which are outside of Europe. Thank you. The Gaz Net Plus, as you know, will stop in 2016 and everyone wants that these actions be prolonged. Among the things important that have been done, many of them are strategic stratégiques for the future et mérite d'être souligné. En premier lieu, euh, le site funding que nous avons euh, amorcé, c'est un jeu de mots, et il est, est important d'être prolongé euh, à une échelle plus grande parce qu'il contribue à, à ces réseaux de coopération scientifique. Euh, la relation bilatérale, birégionale, pardon, entre l'Europe et la région Pacifique est cruciale et elle, elle doit être prolongée au-delà des plateformes birégionales et une coordination des petits pays euh, tant au niveau national que régional de leur stratégie est sans doute un excellent outil pour pérenniser cette, cette relation qui pourrait être annuelle ou biannuelle avec une structure équivalente au niveau européen. Et bien sûr, d'un point de vue plus thématique, euh, les systèmes d'observation du changement climatique dans la région pacifique sont à intensifier, euh, région dont l'importance est reconnue sur le plan du climat mondial et région qui mérite de d'avoir des outils plus performants pour l'observation de son propre climat. L'Europe, dans, dans son positionnement, je dirais, scientifique, parmi d'autres positionnements dans la région pacifique, a proposé à l'IRD de devenir un collaborateur premier, je dirais, en proposant à l'IRD de coordonner la plateforme PESNET. Et je dirais que ce choix est pertinent, parce que l'IRD a une particularité unique aujourd'hui, tant en France qu'en Europe, c'est le seul établissement de recherche publique interdisciplinaire dont toutes les missions sont centrées sur les pays du Sud. Donc au niveau, je dirais, de cette spécificité, au niveau de cette historique, écoutez, regardez, ici dans le Pacifique, l'IRD est présent depuis 50 ans en Polynésie, depuis plus de 70 ans en Nouvelle-Calédonie. We've been able, to, for example, uh, be a member of the Pi Earn, which is, uh, I, I, I believe, um, the funding, the initial funding, came from uh, members of the PaceNet, and this for us is very valuable because not only is it providing a regional network of uh, island universities, but the what it means for us to have a regional research agenda to have a network so that we can then do a lot of collaboration at the regional level we can share information we can share the expertise which right now is uh, as as i've uh, said earlier on is um, something that we need to grow within our university so it's been a very valuable experience for us um, and a very rewarding experience basenet brought us together, brought the two uh, regions together and uh, we sort of found out that there has been more dialogue happening in the last uh, few years. One uh, very good evidence of that is uh, the number of proposals um, our university has uh, submitted for the seed funding. We have never had like anything more than one or two but this time around we had nine proposals from our faculty itself which, which shows that the, the networking is, is growing and we have more confidence in liaising with our European partners. Yes, it was very interesting because we had uh, all come together at a place after an invitation and uh, uh, I found out after, after the meeting, we sat down to have some coffee, I think it was coffee, 
and you could see two groups of people uh, at two ends of the table. So you had the Pacific group here and you had the European group here. And there was hardly any, any talk between them. But, you know, they, should, they were having their own groups and own discussions. So that's how it started and it was interesting because uh, um, after one or two meetings that you could slowly see them uh, getting together and having discussions. And now what we see is that we don't see um, that sort of separate groups. And whenever people meet now you see them you know, having their own fun and, and, and they forget about their own Pacific brothers or their European uh, friends. They have their own small groups now, which is, which is really quite amazing.